This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 517, recorded on October 26th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hello. It's great to be here. It's you and me. Uh, it's just us. <laughs> You're alone in your office. I'm alone in mine. It's so funny. Uh, we, of course, have done many twists with two people, but mm -hmm. um, this is one of the first times I can remember where everyone's got some kind of conflict except me and, and one other person. Yeah. And it's a good thing we brought you on not too long ago, right? <laughs> yes. Well, it's also a good thing because uh, from time to time, it gets me out of meetings. It's always a good thing. Yes. I um, I, I always think if I couldn't get anyone else, what, should I just do it myself? I've never done a TWIV on my own mm -hmm. because it's not about that. It's about a conversation, right? Right. And so... I would probably walk the halls and say, hey, you want to be in a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my former students is now a grad student in your department, so I'm sure he'd come by. That's right. I've, I've seen him a few times. Yep. Tyler, right? Tyler, yes. Yeah. Of course, I have Amy in my lab. She could always come and do it as oh, well. Oh, perfect. But um, yeah, I don't I don't want to have a monologue. Yeah. That's for something else. I'm not sure else. that that would be quite as much fun to listen to. No, it's, I mean, I could make it good, interesting, but the thing about having people on is you get the give and take. Plus when you pause to look up something, someone, you, someone else usually jumps in, right? Right. And exactly. starts talking. So, yes. but all right. So here we are, uh, before we do some science, let me tell you about the Pan American Society for Clinical Virology. They're running regional meetings. They have two this fall. They're both called Diagnostic Testing for HIV Implementation and Quality Assurance Tips for the Clinical Lab. So if you're into clinical laboratory science, this is for you. Uh, they're going to take place in San Diego and Houston on November 16th and December 17th. And we will give links in the show notes for information and registration for those meetings. I also want to make an appeal for everyone if you haven't already done so, to subscribe to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash P-R-O-F-V-R-R. The reason is that YouTube is giving away educational grants for making videos for their YouTube channel, and you need to have 25,000 subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed, and I've been doing this plea on Twitter and Facebook all week, and we've gotten about a thousand new subscribers, so that's great. Excellent. But we are at sixteen thousand. We need, um, we need over nine thousand. Yes. Well, I've been announcing it in all of my classes. Thank you. It's the kids that are going to do it. Exactly. If, if it happens, because um, the adults are just not into it that much. But and um I know how many YouTube channels they go to for class to find things out and hear different perspectives and learn other parts of the material. So yeah, I think yeah. they'll find it really useful when they subscribe and it'll help out a lot. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious to see if my, if our channel has what it takes to go viral basically, you know, to get 9,000 subs. I'm not sure it has, you know, we're not celebrity driven. We're not political driven. We're not controversy driven. Are there are a lot of education podcasts that have 25,000 subscribers. Yeah. Um, there are, yeah. Okay. So SciShow, which is a YouTube channel, uh, right. has, has lots, yeah. I mean, they have a team and they do all of science. <laughs> we have a little team. Right, but. right, right. So on our YouTube channel, by the way, in case you didn't know, we have uh, my virology course lectures, which are revised every spring, and they do well. We also have the parasitology lectures that Dixon and Daniel made this past year. We have episodes of TWIV and TWIP and the other podcasts. When we go on the road, we, we do a video. We have uh, some Virus Watch, which is a short video series that I dabble in. 
um, and a few other things. So there's there's a bunch of stuff there, and you might find something you like. A lot of people on Twitter are saying how much they love it, and they'd be happy to subscribe. So just do that. Let's see if we can get over 25K, and then I can apply for this. If not, well, we'll have more subscribers. Sounds good. When do you need the 25K? Don't know. Oh. You know, the thing about uh, YouTube is once you get to a certain point, then then it takes off, mm-hmm. right? And they say once you have a, your first million subscribers, then the sky's the limit because they just, uh, they yeah. favor you and they, they pour in more and more. I don't need a million right now, but 25,000. Let's try that. Let's see if we can do it. I think that sounds, I think I have about 25, so you're doing a lot better than I than I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been doing it a while, right? I've yeah. been doing it about 10 years. Um, yeah, I don't know when I started exactly and why, but uh, it's a good thing to have a presence there. Yes, I agree. Um, today we have two papers that are really related. They are. I really liked thinking about the relationships between the topics and how the first paper kind of talked about the or got into the rationale for why people did they did the experiments in the second paper and they're both about bats and who doesn't love bats and it's halloween coming up too <laughs> exactly it's just in time for halloween perfect we have some bats. perfect so the idea here in both papers are about viruses in bats and whether these pose a threat to humans and we exactly. call that whether these viruses that you find in bats of course many other animals as well but in bats there seem to be a lot of them whether they have zoonotic potential. And uh, we've talked about this before on TWIV. We had TWIV 364, where it was called It's Not SARS 2.0, where Ralph Barrick and Vinit Menacheri came and talked about their work, where they try and find out if SARS-like viruses that circulate in bats pose a threat to humans. And people criticize these, some people criticize these experiments because they say, oh, you're, you're studying these potentially dangerous viruses, but you have to rescue the virus out of the bat and do some work on it. Otherwise, you're not going to know. We also did a cool paper, TWIV 183, that was called Bats Out of Hell. <laughs> <laughs> and there they had a paper that had been published in Nature uh, Communications, Bat Host Major Mammalian Paramyxoviruses. Big study of 119 bats uh, and rodent species, 9,278 individuals, and they found 66 new paramyxoviruses. And that's actually going to figure in today's second paper. It is. Uh, um, and TWIV 484 uh, was a, involved a paper talking about sting um, an antiviral protein in bats and how mm, changes right. in sting might um, allow bats to harbor additional viruses um, without interferon activation. Because there's always a question of, do the bats get sick from these viruses? Mm-hmm. Uh, that paper addressed that a bit. So a key thing here is that you could sequence bats left and right and find new sequences. But unless you get virus, you can't really answer any questions exactly <laughs> you gotta we don't know get if the virus. bats get sick we don't know what happens we don't know if people get sick we just know the virus exists we know, we always say here on twiv that pcr is not infectious virus so just because you find a sequence in the bat doesn't mean the virus is actually there but as you'll see in these two papers they took these sequences of two different viruses from bats and reconstructed a virus and worked with it. And that's really what you need to do. And, and a similar thing was done with the corona, the SARS-like coronaviruses in bats in that paper I mentioned earlier. So this is a good pair. And mm-hmm. um, and it ha- happens that in both cases, the virus are negative-stranded RNA viruses. How about that yes. <laughs> as well? So the first paper is a Nature microbiology paper called The Discovery of Bombali Virus Adds Further Support for Bats as Hosts of Ebola Viruses. This comes from a big consortium of people from a number. And these authors contributed, let's see, the first two, Tracy Goldstein and Simon Anthony. Contributed equally. And then Joanna, Jonna Mazette. Mazet, yeah. The last author. Mazet, Okay. So John Mazze is the last author, and, and <clears throat> the last author, and I interviewed <laughs> Jana a couple of years ago, 
you can find it on my YouTube channel. She talks about wanting to identify all the viruses in the world. <laughs> it's an ambitious project. It's an ambitious project and all the more reason to subscribe to YouTube. Also on this paper, uh, there are a lot of other authors. There, are, there are a couple I know: Rohit Jangra and uh, Kartik Chandran. So they're both at Albert Einstein School of mm -hmm. Medicine. They will be on TWIV sometime this year to talk about some of their work. Um, then we have Sagi Shapira, who is uh, here in, in, at Columbia and has a joint appointment in my department. He, he's a relatively new faculty. I see him often. And, of course, Ian Lipkin is on this as well. You, you don't recognize anyone else, do you? I don't. Ian Lipkin was the one that really stood out to me. So we got UC Davis, Columbia University, EcoHealth Alliance, Einstein College of Medicine, mm, some place. Well, some uh, people in Sierra Leone. Yeah, Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone. Metabiota, a company in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. All right. So here we have, um, this is it, looking at an Ebola virus in bats. And of course, there's still an ongoing Ebola virus outbreak in DRC. There is in that conflict zone. Um, they're having a lot of trouble tracking cases and getting interventions to those people who are infected. It's a really difficult situation. Right. Now, as we've mentioned before, Ebola viruses, and, and when Jens come on, comes on, he tells us how to call them. The, right. the family <laughs> is the Filoviridae. And the, there are five species of Ebola viruses. So Ebola viruses are called Zaire virus, Bundibugio virus, Sudan virus, Thai forest virus, and Reston virus. And yes. the one that's ongoing in DRC is Zaire. Zaire. Oh, that's the big uh, one. It causes most of the infections, right? That's the big one. And Reston um, has not been seen to cause uh, symptomatic infections right. in people. So the question here is, what is the reservoir of Ebola viruses? And as we've talked about, bats are a big candidate mm -hmm. because people can find antibodies to Ebola viruses in bats, but no one has ever gotten an infectious virus out of a bat right. or even a complete genome. You've gotten bits of genomes. So that's what they're trying to do here. They did a big survey in Sierra Leone to try and get better sequences. Right. And of course, Sierra Leone is in West Africa instead of in sort of the Central African region by DRC, where so many of the outbreaks have been. Right. So they collected 1,278 samples from 535 animals. That includes 244 bats, 46 rodents. 240 dogs and five cats. Five cats. <laughs> <laughs> five little cats. And I think five, we could tell you right away the dogs and the, dogs and the cats were negative, right? Yes. Um, and these are 20 different places in Sierra Leone. They took oral and rectal, rectal swabs and three oral and two swabs from four insectivorous bats. They eat insects. They were positive using what they call a broadly reactive filovirus family level set of primers. So this right. would detect any filovirus, including Ebola viruses or Marburg viruses. And this is also sort of interesting because we usually talk about fruit bats um, yeah. with a yeah. lot of these viruses. Right. So insectivorous bats. These are insect bats. Uh, and rectal swabs from two of the four were also positive with a genus level PCR assay. Uh, and that fragment had 83% nucleotide identity to known Ebolas. And the dogs and the cats and the rodents were all negative. So um, they said, what what, um, what else can we find? Mm -hmm. So, um, th And they wanted to know what kind of bats these were. So they identified th of the four positive bats, three were little free-tailed bats. <laughs> I love the name. I know. They're, they're always very uh, colorful names of all of these bats. And the fourth bat was an Angolan free-tailed bat. And these bats co-roost. They're widely distributed across Western and Sub-Saharan Africa. And they were sampled back in 2016 at three different sites in the Bombali district. Hence, now you know why it's called Bombali virus. Exactly. And these bats were found inside human dwellings. Right. 
So that means they have potential contact with people and other things as well. So they got 98% of the genome from the oral swab of the Angolan free-tailed bat. And they got the rest. They got the ends um, to fill in the whole thing so they could make two complete Bombali virus genomes. So these are the first two complete Ebola virus sequences from bats. Yes. And this paper uh, got some news coverage before it was even published um, that some people were a little bit uh, finding to be a little bit controversial um, about publishing the fact that this virus existed before anyone saw the paper. Well, isn't it supposed to be covered when when the um, embargo lifts? Yes, um, but it, somehow mm. there was something about Bombali virus on um, mm. on social media um, wow. pretty early after it was found, and there was a lot of discussion about whether that was sort of the right thing to do because people were very afraid all of a sudden. Suppose, um, but there was yeah. no information to go along with that. Yeah, yeah, that's too bad. Somebody in this big group of authors or someone they knew must have leaked it, I guess. I guess so. Oh, well. So the sequence analysis of Bombali virus shows that it's probably a new species, right? And so, the, again, the species are the ones we mentioned earlier, you know, the Zaire, the Bundibugio, et cetera. So this would be a Bombali. So I think they're going to call it Bombali Ebola virus. Yes, and then there's six. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that for many other viruses, people don't want them named after the locale. Right. Sinombre, of course, being the example that always comes to mind. <laughs> but this, apparently, in, in these areas, people don't mind hmm. being associated. I wonder why with, that is. You know, the Ebola River was originally a river in Africa, right? So Yes. still yes. still is a river in Africa. It, it is still a river as, in Africa. As Alan hasn't Dove, gone away. As Alan Dove would no doubt tell me if he were here. Yes. Alan Dove, by the way, is in Palm something, uh, California. Oh, Palm yeah. Springs, he said, where it's 84 and sunny. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's nice. It, it's 40, 47 and not sunny here. It's pretty crowd, cloudy today. Yeah. So the, the overall, the virus has 55 to 59% nucleotide identity or 64 to 72% amino acid to other Ebola viruses. And they rescreened all of their samples using a PCR assay they designed that would be bomb, Bombali virus specific. And it was very sensitive. You could get 10 genome copies. And it didn't cross-react with Marburg virus, um, Loviu virus, which is another member of the Filoviridae in a different family. And also fun to say. Found in a cave in Spain, I believe, um, or other known Ebolas. So these four positive animals, they had anywhere from four genome copies to 10,000 per microliter. Mm-hmm. 10,000 is a lot. Yes, it is. Rectal swab from one bat was positive with three genome copies for per microliter. Then they wondered if these bats had actually acquired these viruses by eating insects. Right, which would be uh, an important thing to know, given that no one really thinks about insects as a host for Ebola viruses. That would be uh, un very unexpected. Right, but they found they looked at a variety of insects and found no. Correlation, so they could detect insect DNA in the bats, right, and mm -hmm. see if that correlated with the presence of the virus, and it did not. Um, they found sequences of a butterfly and a hexapod. If Dixon were here, he'd tell us he what that was <laughs> would be, but they didn't correlate with the presence of virus. So they think that the bats are not simply eating these viruses; they're there replicating mm -hmm. in the bats. When we talk about bats in general, I, I mentioned earlier that. It's been suggested that they might be hosts because, one, you can find antibodies, but also um, you can infect some bats with you know, Ebola viruses, certain Ebola viruses in the laboratory. Bats were suggested to be the cause of the outbreak in 2013 in West Africa. So um, here we have another virus, and we need to know now where it is in bats. Right, yes. Because we just know that it's in these couple of bats from a certain area in Sierra Leone. But if that's all the places you find it, then it's not likely to be a, an issue with getting it to people. Right. Well, and we need to know things like, do we think it will infect human cells and all of that, which is something to do down the line. Now, this um, 
virus is different enough from the other Ebola viruses that it does not explain previous outbreaks in humans. We should make that clear, right? If yes. if anything, the, the concern is whether this would jump into people at some point in the future. We'd know it because the sequence would match up with this one. But as far as we know, it hasn't. Right. So it's more about whether this would be the next Ebola uh, leading to an epidemic in humans. Yep. So they don't actually do the experiment you said, which would be to make the whole virus right, and exactly. ask if it can inform hum- infect human cells, which I guess they're doing. You have to do that in a BSL-4 facility. Right. That that would be the next step. But they, they first do the experiments that you would want to know first, which is what happens in terms of entry into cells. Because if the virus can't enter, then the rest of the steps are not going to happen. Most likely not. Right. right. So they have the glycoproteins of the envelope glycoproteins of uh, Bombali virus. They make a recombinant VSV with where the, the Bombali glycoproteins have replaced the VSV glycoproteins. Um, that's called a pseudotyped virus. And of course, if you've been listening to Dwiv, you know that the vaccine, <laughs> the, the current <laughs> Ebola vaccine, is exactly that kind exactly of a this. pseudotype with Ebola virus glycoprotein. Um, and so we the, already have a vaccine for this. We we have a vaccine for the Zaire strain. My understanding mm-hmm. is that it doesn't protect uh, well against the others, so you would need to have either a multivalent vaccine or, or multiple vaccines for the other viruses, right? But but this recombinant VSV, in theory, could be a vaccine be for Bombay. Be a vaccine. Yeah, sure, in theory, right. So they show this recombinant can infect human osteosarcoma cells. So it can attach to them, it can get in. And the entry of Ebola viruses, this is the part I really thought was cool, uh, depends on neiman pick c one protein. And we've talked about it a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Kartik Chandran, one of the labs involved in that, he's been on TWIV talking about that. It's an interesting endosomal receptor. And apparently the same receptor is important for Bombali glycoprotein entry into cells because they could take these cells and knock out the gene for uh, neiman pick c one protein, and the virus, the pseudotype viruses can't infect them. That's really cool. I wouldn't have predicted that it would use this, utilize the same receptor, right? No, not at all. And we know exactly how the Ebola glycoprotein interacts with NPC one. The structure of the two interacting has been solved, and so they could model. Uh, the Bombali differences, and they can see that I, all of the interacting residues are conserved with it, with two exceptions that don't seem to matter. Yep. So that to me was pretty neat that such a distant virus, of course, all the Ebola viruses, they're all species. They all bind NPC1. So this is another species. So I guess that makes perfect sense, right? Right. So, you know, it just also shows how strongly this binding is conserved. Yeah. Um, if there's variation um, in, you know, throughout other parts of the virus, but so little variation here. Yeah. So then now that this works, we know the Bombali glycoprotein works to enter human cells. Now it makes sense to go ahead and reconstruct the entire virus, Bombali virus, and see if it will infect and replicate and produce infectious virus, right? Right, exactly. And I'm sure so, that's ongoing in some BSL-4 somewhere. I would assume as much. Yep, yep. Um, and we'll see the results in, I'd say, I would say about a year, right? Probably. Uh, that sounds about right. Um, so they, they say here, binding. we acknowledge that binding is not the only determinant of host susceptibility, but it is the first step. Mm-hmm. And if this virus could replicate in human cells, then maybe it could infect humans, but that's a big leap. It's still, you know, other things have to happen. Uh, and of course, if it can't replicate in human cells, then it's probably not much of a concern. Right, exactly. So it will be really interesting to see um, what happens when they actually, you know, reconstruct the whole virus and start to look yeah, more closely right. at replication. Um, so we can see, you know, is this something that we're trying to, we're able to think about a future zoonotic virus or is this a virus that hasn't quite made it that far yet? They make a statement in the end. They say, oh, where is it? 
Uh, we suggest that it is unlikely that a virulent pathogen such as Ebola would circulate in humans without causing disease. I would like to take issue with that statement because there have been a number of studies, serological studies in Africa, showing seropositive people for Ebola viruses who have not been apparently seriously sick. Right. I think in some cases it gets up to almost 20% in a few of those studies that were seropositive. Right. Now, you could always say, well, maybe those aren't specific enough, whatever the assay being used. Um, and you're getting cross-reactive Ebola viruses, like Bombali, maybe. Who knows? Maybe. But there is some, there's good evidence. There are a bunch of papers. One earlier this year I, I blogged about um, where they found uh, seropositive humans without serious disease. So I, I suspect that there are some infections that, uh, don't lead to serious disease, as with many other viruses, right? Right. And that's another reason why knowing about this virus and understanding the full diversity of these Ebola viruses is really important because we can start to determine whether there are some of those cross-reactive viruses that might be um, messing up our serology or giving mm -hmm. people a little bit of protection against uh, Ebola Zaire or the other very pathogenic viruses should they come around. So that would be an interesting experiment to find out if antibodies against Bombali or Ebola viruses are cross-reactive, right? Right, cross-reactive, and particularly if protective. they're cross-protective. Yeah. Now they say in the end here, we stress that our study is not meant to create alarm or incite the retaliatory culling of bats, <laughs> which I, I, I wouldn't think that people would start killing bats because of this, right? Yeah, I don't, I think that there have been enough uh, other things uh, tied to bats that if people were going to start doing retaliatory culling, that would have already happened. Yeah, you know, I, I. It's interesting that they have that last paragraph where they defend bats as being important, and, is, and then yeah. they end up All saying we actually don't know if the virus causes disease. <laughs> right. So exactly. Maybe this is in response to the. Uh, Concerns that you mentioned earlier before the paper were, was published, this, right? This very well might have been. And I feel like I want to read part of this to my students when I teach emerging infectious disease because they hear about some of the bat diseases and come up with all sorts of reasons why bats are terrible. And so I'd like to just, you know, remind them about their importance as insectivorous pollinators and seed dispersers. Yeah, of course. Nothing is nothing out there is really terrible. They don't mean to be terrible, right? It's just, it's just nature. You know, exactly. mosquitoes spread diseases, but they're not, they're not terrible. They don't do it on purpose. They <laughs> just happen exactly. to be taking a blood meal and stuff happens, right? Right. All right. That's paper number one. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and then we have a second one in Cell Reports, Entry Replication, Immune Evasion, and Neurotoxicity of Synthetically Engineered Bat-Borne Mumps Virus. Also so very cool. This comes from... Mostly Germany, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. mostly yep. Germany. The Institute of Virology in Hanover, Germany. Hanover, Germany. Oh, here we have an FDA one FDA person at uh, Silver Spring. Uh, we have someone from the Karolinska in Stockholm and the German Pri German Primate Center in Göttingen. Okay, Nadine Kruger and Christian Sauder are the first two authors, and the last author is Marcus Hoffman. And I recognize a couple of names on this paper. I recognize George Herler, Jan Drexler, Christian Drosten, and Marcus Hoffman. So Very again, good. again, bats, but again, bats. this is based on the study in, in Nature reports that we mentioned earlier, where they found all these paramyxoviruses. Mm -hmm. And among them um, was a bat mumps virus related to human mumps virus. Right. And this is also kind of interesting because Nipah and Hendra, um, other viruses that have been associated with bats are also paramyxoviruses. That's right. That's right. And so, again, they don't have virus isolates. And right. So this, the, this is, that's what we're going to do here. So mumps virus, of course, is a, a human paramyxovirus, which causes mumps. If you're vaccinated, it doesn't. When I was a kid, I had mumps because I was born before the vaccine, uh, which I think emerged in the 60s, and um, it's the Gerald Lynn vaccine made by Maurice Hilleman. He isolated the virus from his daughter, and he brought it to the lab and used it to generate the vaccine strain. Great story. 
It's a, it is a good story. <laughs> I I fortunately have not had to experience mumps, um, and I had to do a little bit of um, investigating to think about neurologic symptoms of mumps because I hadn't put a lot of thought into them in a while. Uh, I usually think just about the uh, mm. salivary glands um, mm-hmm. and not the encephalitis. But the this paper mentioning neurotoxicity reminded me of the encephalitis parts of mumps, as well as things like um, hearing loss. That's right. So mumps, I remember someone telling me years ago that in maybe half of mumps infections, you can find evidence of virus in the CNS, although it is not highly neurovirulent in humans. So mm-hmm. it's highly neuroinvasive, but not it doesn't cause disease often. So it gets in there, but it doesn't do a lot. But everyone knows mumps from the parotitis exactly. <laughs> inflammation of the salivary glands, right? Exactly. Uh, now, this these are an envelope negative strand RNA virus is very much like Ebola virus, except they don't look like Ebola viruses. The no. Ebola viruses are filamentous, and these are spherical viruses. And some of the proteins are important for what happens later. So there's a hemagglutinin in neuraminidase on the, cell, on the virus surface that binds to sialic acid receptors on the cell. There's a fusion or F glycoprotein that mediates fusion at the plasma membrane. This is pH independent fusion. Mm-hmm. And when these infected cells later on make both F and HN, it causes neighboring cells to fuse and make these multinucleated cells called syncytia. Yes. Then we have another protein. It's called SH, small hydrophobic protein. And there's another one called V or 5 protein. Yes. <laughs> these interfere with innate immune responses. SH interferes with TNF alpha signaling and and F kappa B activation and and the V protein interferes with interferon production. I think it interferes with stat signaling, right? Right, with stat signaling, and this is specific to human mumps. Um, right, this is all human you're mumps talking so about. far. That's right. Yes, exactly. In fact, we didn't know there were non-human mumps viruses until we found them in bats. Basically. Right. And and that's sort of also interesting because we assume that many of our viruses were originally zoonotic in origin. Yeah. Um, and we didn't necessarily know of a virus that could have become mumps. Right. Right. So this is, uh, I'm not sure this particular virus is, but an ancestor exactly. clearly has the potential. So this mumps, this bat mumps virus. Uh, had been identified in that sequence analysis before, and others had done work making pseudotypes like we discussed in the previous paper with the, this it's bat. like with VSV. Yeah. Yeah. But in this one, they want to rescue the entire genome. Mm-hmm. So they got the whole genome sequence. They built a plasmid with the entire viral genome in it. And th- for, for negative strand viruses, it's it's a little tricky to do a rescue of viruses from infectious clones. You, can't just put a plasmid in with the entire genome like you can with polio virus. Right. You have to put a plasmid with the entire genome that will make a plus strand RNA, not a minus strand. Mm-hmm. And then you have to put individual plasmids for a few of the other viral proteins to get that initial plus strand to be copied and, and transcribed into mRNAs. So a little more complicated, but that you can do it. And, um, they end up rescuing virus. Right. And the key thing here is that now they can finally do the types of experiments we were talking about with the other paper, where they can start to look at replication and um, in human cells and things like that. So exactly what we were saying we would love to see for the next paper in a year or so, they're able to do here. And of course, they can because it's mumps and it's not a BSL-4. Right. It's not exactly. a BSL-3. Although- it's a BSL-2, I would presume. I would presume so as well. Although I had this paper on my desk um, earlier this week and um, someone looked at it and said, synthetically engineered mumps, why? Why? Yes, uh, of course. If you don't, if you're not familiar with the questions, you would say that, right? Exactly. Um, and so the why is so that we can finally answer those questions about is it infectious in human cells? Um, what kinds of um, replication, what kinds of functions does this virus have? All the things that we wanted to know about the virus in the previous paper. So then they take their virus, which was grown in, I should say, grivet cells. Excellent. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> yes, that now, is correct. Even though the cell line is African green monkey, 
kidney. Now we call them grivets, which yes, Jens they are was, officially grivets. Re, Jens was very excited about that. Yes. Uh, in fact, we have some cell lines from some African green monkeys in my lab, and I have had to learn about the finer details of different types of African green monkeys. So grivet is correct. Of course, the, the real name is Vero cells, right? Right, yeah. Which is, which is neutral enough, so it doesn't matter. Uh, they take that virus and they say, can it infect human cells? And they initially infect, and they can do immunofluorescence and see viral proteins in the cells. They have some lovely immunofluorescence photographs mm -hmm. showing that. Uh, next, they infect some human lines, some non-human primate lines, some bat cells, and the virus works in all of them. And they can get infectious titers of, of, good high, of uh, high levels, and they do plaque assays to measure them. Yes, they do. It's so exciting um, to see a plaque assay. It is. And the other thing that's really interesting about this is that in many cases, this bat virus replicates to a higher titer than does the human virus, human right. mumps. Right. Um, <laughs> including in some of these human cells, um, the bat virus is actually able to replicate to a higher titer. And they get respectable titers, 10 to the 6 PFU per mil in some bat cells. In human cells, there's a human colon cell line called Keiko 2, 10 to the 7.7 .7 PFU per mil. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. And yeah, it did better than human mumps. How yes. about that? Hmm. Uh, and then accompanying the infection, they can see cytopathic effects. The classic one is the cell-to-cell -cell fusion, which yes. we mentioned earlier, syncytia formation, which they can see to different extents in the different cell lines. Some, some of them have very little cytopathic effects. Right. There's a really nice image of a um, cell with a lot of nuclei. You can see, you can sort of see that nice classic syncytia in one of their images pretty pretty beautifully. Yep, they're very nice. So the receptor for uh, human mumps viruses um, is sialic acid, or an attachment protein is sialic acid. It's a sugar on the surface of cells. So they ask, does the bat virus bind to the same and you can that's a really cool way to do that is you can take neuraminidase which you can buy as an enzyme which will cleave sialic acid mm -hmm. on the surface of cells and you can put increasing amounts of neuraminidase on and show that the binding of the soluble hn which they can make by themselves or virus after infection goes down exactly so it's just a nice competition assay to show that um, in fact, there is sialic acid dependent binding of yep. this protein. Yep. And um, they can also show that VSV, which doesn't bind sialic acid, it is not affected by this treatment. So that's a nice negative control. Exactly. Right. So I should say that we, and this is sort of related to your pick later, we in the lab work on enterovirus D68. Mm -hmm. And we have a bioarchive paper there. It's, it's under review um, where we treat cells with neuraminidase and show that uh, you can still get infection after ah. removing sialic acid from the cell surface. And many people have said, oh, sialic acid is the receptor for EVD68. Well, if you take sialic acid off, virus can still infect. So there must be something else. Exactly. It, it drops it down a little bit, but virus can still infect. Next set of experiment, excuse me. The next set of experiments deal with the fusion step of virus entry. So after the virus binds to the cell surface by the HN, the F glycoprotein of the virus catalyzes fusion right at the plasma membrane, with, and you don't need low pH to do that. It happens at neutral pH, and it's right. mediated by the F protein. And in order for the F protein to do that, it has to be cleaved. It has to be proteolytically cleaved. And it's done so by a cell protease called furins. And furins are ubiquitous cell proteases. That means they're everywhere. Uh, they have a, a multi-basic cleavage site. And they can make cells that don't have furins and show that the infection of human and bat mumps doesn't happen because there's no furin. Exactly. They also look at the fusion peptide. Um, between human and bat mumps and show that the um, peptide is conserved. Mm -hmm. So the peptide that inserts into the cell membrane is conserved between both of these two viruses. Right. They also have a furin inhibitor, and they show that that also blocks infection. 
whereas inhibitors of trypsin and trypsin-like serine proteases have no effect, and you would expect that because this is not cleaved by trypsin. So uh, I like that. That's a cool experiment. That is a good experiment. And um, I was reading this, and Amy was here, and I said, hey, why don't we see if furins are involved in antro D68? And she said, well, why? Nothing is cleaved. I said, well, it's such an easy experiment. Let's just. <laughs> I was just going to ask you whether or not you had done that, but I didn't want to, you know, make you give away your secrets. No, it, it's, uh, you know, there's no evidence that furins are involved in any way, but it's so easy to do, right? Right. You just infect cells and see if the virus replicates that. It's it's a no-brainer because someone will do it one day and find an amazing result and you go, oh, why didn't I do that? Exactly. By the way, I wanted to mention furin in another virus. So influenza virus HA is also cleaved, which is important for fusion. Um, but it's not cleaved by furins, at, le- at least not in the human influenza viruses. However, the H5N1 highly pathogenic influenza viruses have a furin cleavage in the HA. It's changed so it can be cleaved by these ubiquitous proteases. And that's one of the reasons we think that these are viruses that can infect a lot of different tissues because furins are in every tissue. Right. A little, so furins can modulate the tropism of viruses. Exactly. And that can really change the pathology um, yep. pretty, pretty dramatically. Now we look at interferon responses. My favorite. Why don't you tell us about that? All right. <laughs> so here uh, they took a look at the ability of um, cells that were treated with interferon or left untreated um, to uh, allow replication of either the bat mumps virus or a human mumps virus or VSV as a control. Uh, and with their VSV control, they saw that if they cultured the cells, either A549s, a human cell line, or some bat cell lines, in the presence of interferon that blocked the ability of the virus to replicate in the cells. Um, And with no interferon, the virus replicated quite well. And in um, the interferon-treated cells that were Looked that had the bat mumps virus, there really wasn't much of a change with and without interferon. There was a little bit of a reduction um, in virus replication with interferon treatment, especially in one of the uh, bat cell lines, um, but not a significant difference in the others. Um, there wasn't a, a terribly dramatic difference with human mumps as well. Um, so VSV was really interferon uh, dependent. Um, and bat mumps and human mumps seem to be somewhat insensitive to interferon replication or interferon production. Right. And they know the cells are interferon responsive, right? Because they look at a couple of ISGs. Exactly. So they looked at ISG 56 and MX um, to make sure that these cells still can respond to interferon and the cells were still perfectly capable of interferon responses. So we did this uh, similar experiment many years ago with poliovirus. And we show that you treat cells with interferon and polio replicates pretty well. And our control was VSV because it's really mm-hmm. sensitive to interferon. Yes. And um, it turns out that another coronavirus, encephalomyocarditis virus, is highly sensitive to interferon. So we swapped a few polio genes into the EMCV and we identified one polio gene, the 2A protease, that confers the ability to grow in interferon treated cells. And that was many years ago. And we haven't, we haven't figured out the mechanism yet. Okay. But that's a, pro- that's a project that may not ever get done if we eradicate polio. Right. Mm, right. And no one can work with the virus anymore. Right. Um, now, I did also notice here that yeah. the um, two mumps viruses were also replicating to a much lower level than VSV overall in this experiment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I kind of wondered why they had chosen cells where their viruses were replicating at such a low level. Mm. These were in, um, what kind of cells were these? So so A549s are human lung cells. Human lungs, yeah. Um, and the others, I believe, are all bat cell lines. Don't know why they picked those, yeah. Yeah, because they had the CACO cells yeah. um, in figure one where there was they got really high levels of replication. And I would think those would respond also to interferon, right? Exactly, mm, yeah. Yeah, don't know. 
Uh, they they wanted to know. So the idea is, if if mumps virus can grow and interfere on treated cells, it must have a protein or or proteins that can antagonize the interferon response, just like polio a story I, I briefly told you. Mm-hmm. And as we know, the V proteins of paramyxoviruses are inhibitors of stat signaling uh, and the interferon response. So they set up an assay um, where they have an interferon beta promoter driving a reporter. What's, right. Do we know what the reporter is here? Um, I guess I just assumed I knew what it was because I do similar experiments, uh, but I don't officially know that. I thought it was luciferase. Yeah, you know, it's funny. These figure legends do not actually describe in detail the No, there were, there were a few things that I think I... Uh, just inferred. I mean, we could go to the, uh, here we go. We could I'm go looking, to it's, the. I'm looking, it's luciferase. Luciferase. That's an easy one, yeah. It is a very so, that, so basically you have a beta interferon promoter hooked up to a luciferase, and then you can add something that would normally stimulate interferon and ask uh, if that can be interfered with by a viral protein, right? Right. And so you don't really need to know exactly which other signaling proteins are involved. You just have to know, is the promoter on or off? Yeah. So let this is. I'm going to look at the details. Figure three. It's the next figure page. three C. Yeah. So this is with and without infection. I pres- no, that's the top. No. Figure. That's so what the- they so what they actually C. do here is they take cells um, and they add their reporter plasmid, mm-hmm. um, and they should get interferon induction even without then, any ligand at all, right? Yep, even without any ligand, and then they add in. Uh, the V protein or the I protein from the bat mumps virus or the human mumps virus yeah. and show that co-transfection of plasmids expressing either uh, the V protein or the I protein, whether it's from bat or from human mumps virus, can indu- can reduce the interferon induction from the promoter. So it's, there do seem to be uh, interferon inhibitors mm-hmm. um, in this virus, specifically the V and the I proteins. So in the absence of a ligand that for TLR or Rig I, what is turning on the interferon beta promoter when you put it in? So that's a great question. Um, they are using a different, um, a different plasmid than I use. Um, I'm not used to PCG1, um, but in our hands, um, General overexpression is probably hitting some of the endogenous DNA receptors. Yeah, yeah. The DNA sensors in the cell. Yeah. So it would be nice to, uh, although I agree that these V and I proteins knock down interferon report, reporter assay, it would be nice to add a ligand that would turn it up even more and see if it still does it, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, when we do experiments like that, the titration of the amounts of ligand can be a little bit tricky. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, that would be a nice experiment to see here. I like that they showed the control in D to show us that the proteins are being expressed at similar levels. Yeah. And it would be also cool, and I'm sure they're doing this, to you know, alter these proteins and virus and show that now you make a virus that can't antagonize interferon responses and they don't replicate well and so forth. But that's obviously right. an, another paper altogether. Yeah, no, that would be fantastic. And perhaps if they did that, um, they wouldn't have the nice immunofluorescence where you can see the virus actually spreading from cell to cell and yeah. interferon blocking that, which is it's just a really pretty figure. Yep. yep. And then they looked at the SH protein, the one that we... Uh, mentioned it antagonizes TNF alpha and NF kappa B, mm-hmm. and they look at human mumps virus SH and bat mumps virus SH. Do they do the same things or similar things? So they have an NF kappa B uh, assay activation assay. I guess right, NF kappa B response element driving a reporter also. Exactly, right? it's the same kind of reporter, but they also have to add in TNF alpha to turn on um, the sort of general background expression of NF kappa B. Yeah. And then they can put in the SH protein from either virus and show it inhibits substantially, yeah. right? Yeah. So that, that's a very large inhibition there. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Do we know how SH does that? I do not know how SH does that, although someone might. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they do. They don't, they don't actually mention it. It's interesting. No, they don't. Um, 
Yes. So uh, this SH protein is uh, as active. The, the bat mumps SH is as active as uh, the human in, in inhibiting activation of the NF-kappa B promoter. And the last assay, or the second to last assay, is a neurovirulence assay where they take uh, rats. I think they're neonatal rats. Yes, they are. And they intracerebrally inoculate them with virus. Uh, and then they see what happens. They have uh, they can do a neurovirulence score, where f- from what I understand, they are making slices for, of the brains a certain time after infection, and then scoring the the pathology. Right, exactly. Developing a uh, score It's very much like you would do it for polio as well. Right, right, right. the The way they wrote it in the methods is a little bit uh, difficult to understand. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that was how I uh, imagined things to yeah, to go. Yeah. They actually say that it doesn't kill the animals right away. So that's why they have to take out the brain, I think, a day after inoculation and, and right. score. You go under a microscope and you count lesions and then you make up a numerical score of that. Right. That, that was what I expected. I thought I would see something about how um, yeah. the scoring was done. And so they, they write a lot about fixing the brains and things like that. And then they just, rats do not develop clinical signs. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> So you see the, the figure shows you a neurovirulence score and then the different viruses. So uh, the, the human virus, you get about 20% neurovirulence score. And these two bad viruses uh, are, um, well, do we have the bad virus, which is about 15%. Mm-hmm. And the R, then they take the human virus and put the bat F and HN proteins in it, right? That's right. previously studied recombinant, and that's slightly... Higher, so they're both neurovirulent in this model. And what I think is cool in this is they they included the Gerald Lynn vaccine strain of mumps. Yeah, yes. Which you can see is is a couple percent, and that's you know it's an attenuated virus that makes perfect sense. Right, that's exactly. Cool. Um, so I think it was also probably worth noting that they're talking about neurovirulence here and how much. Um, pathology they can get, but they're really not studying neuroinvasiveness here, given right. that they're doing an intracerebral infection. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we are bypassing neuroinvasion, absolutely. So yeah. if you wanted to look at neuroinvasion, you'd have to put it peripherally. And if these rats are not going to replicate the virus, there's very little chance that that's going to happen unless you put tons of virus in, in which case it'd be really um, artificial. So I'm not sure they have right. a, a good model, but it is neurovirulent, which simply means, or I should say neurotropic and neurovirulent because it's replicating mm-hmm. in nerve cells right. and it's causing some pathology, which they're, they're scoring here. That's the neurovirulence part. Yes. Of course, it gets to um, the point that you like, often make about whether or not viruses have evolved to do this or whether it's a dead end. Um I love, talking, at, I love talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And since we can't look at invasiveness here, um, it becomes very difficult to really talk about whether the yeah, virus sure, sure. evolved to actually go into the brain or whether it just happens to do it as a byproduct. So we have the same issue with Entro 68. We can show that it will, all the isolates we look at from 1962 to the present can are neurotropic. They will replicate in human neurons and culture. Mm-hmm. but we don't know if they're neuroinvasive. We know the virus can replicate in nerve cells, so if it can get into the CNS, it would be able to do so. Whether or not it evolved to do that, I think no, because it makes no sense for the virus to, to get into the CNS because it's a dead end. But you know, it could be an accident of some other change that's needed for replication elsewhere. You just don't exactly, know. exactly. We don't really think viruses at each other. So correct, correct. Oh, the last experiment uh, we look at antibodies. Yes. And uh, I guess uh, some previous work had been done uh, with antibodies against human mumps virus strains showing that these could neutralize human mumps virus that produce the bat F and HN glycoproteins. So that's pretty good evidence that they cross react, right? Mm -hmm. But they said, ah, we should do the whole infectious cycle. And so they ask whether antibodies... Uh, will will actually neutralize the bat mumps virus itself. So they have antibodies against a variety of human mumps virus strains. I, I guess they have one, two, three different human strains. 
and they all they all neutralize uh, this um, bat mumps virus. This this data are actually just given to you in the text. There's no table yes, or figure. I know. <laughs> I I got very confused as I looked at that part of the text and tried to find the corresponding figure. Yeah, there is none. Yeah, a couple of times. So they say the neutral the fifty percent neutralizing dose for the um, here's one example just to tell you how this works for the uh, bat mumps virus. 112, and the same uh, 50% neutralizing dose against a human virus would be 188. So that's the, well, I'm not quite sure how they're expressing it, but the 50% neutralizing dose is what you would need to, of the concentration of antibody to neutralize half of your inoculum. Right. And so I don't know what these numbers are. <laughs> 112 and 188. Um, are they inverse dilutions? You know, usually you would do an inverse of the dilution, right. but I'm not sure how they expressed it. Maybe they tell us in the methods. Um, Let's see. It's a, yeah, it's a dilution series. Um, Must be a reciprocal of the dilution. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Uh, we're incubated with dilution series. Uh, the um, concentration of antibody that protects 50% of samples has got to be the inverse. Right? Exactly. Because it's a, it's a big integer. Okay. Right. So antibodies against mumps seem to block infection of the bat mumps virus. That's good. So get your mumps vaccine and you don't have to worry about this bat mumps virus, right? <laughs> exactly. So now I feel very protected against the bat mumps virus, even though I don't know if the bat mumps virus could have actually caused any disease had I uh, been infected yeah. with it. We have no idea. We know from this work, which is kind of nice, that it replicates in human cells, right? It causes similar yeah. CPE as a human virus. Same determinant, sialic acid, furin cleavage of the F protein. Lots of human lines are susceptible. Also replicates in the presence of uh, interferon, just like human mumps virus. And it seems to be neurotropic and neurovirulent, right? Right, exactly. Now, what I find interesting is that, um, so these bats where they got this virus from, or at least the sequence, go from sub-Saharan Africa to South Africa. Mm -hmm. And so the, it's, it's possible that this bat mumps virus has a similar distribution. So then right. you look at mumps vaccination in Africa, it's only routinely performed in a few places. You know, so right. the, the implication there is that you know, this it, isn't causing a disease. If it, it may not be, or if it spilled over, maybe it's not spilling over. Who knows? Right. Also true. These people wouldn't be protected. So they need to get uh, vaccinated. And they say in 2016, there were 100,000 mumps cases in Africa because not a lot of people are immunized, right? Mm -hmm. I would say it's probably a good idea to be immunized just to protect you against mumps. And at the same time, you're going to be protected against this virus, right? Right. Exactly. And so, all the more reason that we should be vaccinating lots of people um, with the mumps vaccine. They say here, uh, the cross-reactivity suggests that the standard measles, mumps, rubella vaccine would confer protection against bat mumps virus. So if this were going to spill over, and we don't know, if you know, even though it replicates in human cells, mm -hmm. you still have to do a lot of other things to replicate in, an, in a human and cause disease. Right. We don't know if this virus is capable of that. But if it could, if you are vaccinated, you would be protected. So, uh, you know, I think it's likely that most of Africa is not infected for economic reasons, right? Probably. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that includes but, measles. You know, there's a lot of measles still in Africa. There and is that's a shame. A that's a shame. There shouldn't be. It's a completely vaccine-preventable disease. Measles, mumps, rubella, they all are. And there's also rubella, which leads to birth defects, uh, exactly, as you know. Exactly, yes. So um, this is a call to the world needs to help each other and, and vaccinate countries that can't afford it, you know. Yes. it. You know, in terms of how much money we get back um, from those vaccines, vaccines make uh, are, are a great economic investment. <laughs> Yeah, and they in these countries they help people to stay healthy and and have productive lives, and so mm -hmm. we really, you know, the Gates Foundation is doing a great job distributing polio vaccines, and I do hope that when that's done, um, they help with measles, mumps, rubella immunization because you could really use uh, use that help. 
Yeah, there are a lot of kids who would um, be much healthier without those viruses. So that's two papers where they looked at the zoonotic potential of uh, an Ebola virus and a mumps virus in bats. And uh, you can see they recovered the viruses, which isn't done very often. And they can show at least for Ebola, the glycoproteins work in human cells. And for the mumps virus from bats, the, the whole virus can replicate in human cells. So we know exactly. that part we know for these viruses and you know the, the rest of the equation, whether it can go into people, we just don't know. Right. So now what we need to figure out is whether or not this will, you know, cause disease in humans. And also we need to figure out whether or not bats get the mumps. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. So that's a hard one because right. we don't, we'll never know if it causes disease until it's in people and causing disease, right? Right, exactly. We can uh, do animal studies left and right, but they're always surrogates for what happens in people. Yeah. I guess what you can do is do surveillance to make sure that these viruses aren't spilling over into people. But, you know, as you know, in these countries, it's very difficult to do that, and uh, it's probably not going to happen. Right. Well, one thing that's also really interesting here is that both of these are negative strand RNA viruses, mm -hmm. and that change in sting um, would affect bats' DNA sensing, and so how they're able to potentially harbor these RNA viruses right. um, is still not so clear. Yeah, so what you said before, do bats get mumps? That's that's an interesting experiment to get some of these animals because, you know, these were these viruses, these sequences were obtained from uh, animals that were captured and we don't know right. anything about their general health. If you right. took if you took a bat in the lab and it were seronegative for this virus, for this mumps virus, say, and then you inoculated it with mumps virus, what would happen, right? Mhm. Mm and I guess you have to take the same species that you isolated it from, but although you, it would be interesting to try different batch species as well, right? Right, absolutely. Um, especially when I think a lot of these species might be um, habitating close together. Um, yeah. And the other thing to remember is that this is one of 60-something new paramyxovirus <laughs> they found right. in that bat study. Let me get the number. 66 new paramyxoviruses. So what's with the other ones, Right. Mm -hmm, exactly. And again, we do know two other paramyxoviruses that have been identified in bats um, that seem to also cause human disease, Hendra and Nipah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so this is an important group of viruses to be further investigating. And of course, uh, the coronaviruses as well, originally sure. in bat, the MERS coronas, the SARS coronaviruses. So yeah, people are have their eye on bats for, for these reasons. Um, Always the bats. And this... You know, you can take these studies a little bit farther, but the ultimate answer is just to be ready in case it happens in humans, in case they spill over into humans. So right. if you have antivirals that work against these other viruses that you could use, if you had vaccines that would cross-react, for example, it's all very hard because there's so many of these other viruses, you don't know which ones to target, but maybe strategies that have a broad capture might work. So, I mean, these are the things that people need to be working on. Exactly. Um, and and studies like this are really important because they start to give us information about that cross-neutralization ability um, and let us know, okay, this is a virus we need to further study and start to give us the information that we might need to develop those antivirals. Exactly. Um, we forgot to mention also this second paper is open access. Um, mm -hmm. So if any of the listeners want to take a look at these data, um, their uh, immunofluorescence data is quite nice. Um, I was rather impressed with yeah, it, especially it's pretty, it's pretty the pretty, CPE yeah. data in the first figure. All right. Let us, we have a couple of emails here. First, okay. first one is from Michelle. Hello, Vincent and the TWIV team. In a recent episode of TWIV, you briefly mentioned honeybee viruses. And so I just wanted to share the Pollination Podcast with you. I recently talked about bee infecting viruses on that show. So we'll put a link to the Pollination Podcast. And I like the, the way they have it capitalized, Pollination. Yep. Yep. I didn't originally make the connection with, you know, <laughs> pollinators. <laughs> it is uh, out of Oregon State University. 
And this is uh, up to episode number 71. Oh. And they it is all about uh, bees for people making bold strides to improve the health of pollinators. That's a cool one. That Not, is a cool nothing one. like a niche podcast, right? Right. Thanks for Twiv and all you do for virology. Michelle is an assistant professor at Montana State University who I've met uh, on previous occasions. And I immediately emailed her and said, your podcast is very nice, but we want you on Twiv. So she's going to come on in December and talk about honeybee viruses. Oh, great. Which is what she works on. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. Thank you, Michelle. I'm sure that there'll be lots of important things to learn there. <laughs> And why don't you take that last one? All right. Bob writes, at the start of the TWIV uh, episode 515, the panel, having previously forsworn babbling about the weather, stubbornly persist in this topic, a very small and quickly dated talk. As one who is irritated by weather chit-chat, I would like to suggest an alternative. Simply discuss the weather to everyone's heart's content, but at the end of the podcast rather than the beginning. Those who don't care for this discussion can stop listening. Those who like it can get their fill. Everyone, question mark, is then happy, happy, happy. I thought of this while listening to the podcast, but coincidentally, just before writing this email, ran across an article called How the Finnish Survive Without Small Talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he provides a link. Um, and he notes that my her heritage is very Irish. My mother came over from Galway, but maybe there is a drop of Finnish blood in my veins. Uh, thanks for all of your interesting podcasts after the weather. Best, Bob. Oh, sorry, Bob. <laughs> well, today was short. We didn't really do weather, right? We really did not do weather. So uh, I understand in the not liking chit chat, but we like to talk to each other. And mm -hmm. it happens that the mic is on and the recorder's on, so it, it gets uh, recorded. Um, yeah, so I know some people don't like the weather, but you know, Bob, almost everyone who writes a letter always has the weather on it. So I can't help but thinking that people like it a little bit. Well, like, well, but, it's, it, it's important to show that, you know, we're people, we're not just, you know. Bob, I guess, knows we're people. He doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> but, okay. uh, it's, I don't think we do weather on the other podcasts, really. This is just Twiv thing, and I don't know how it started, but we'll we'll try and tone it down. It's not a problem with me. Uh, okay, let's do some picks. Brianne, right. what you got for us this yes. week? So I have an article from Ed Yong in The Atlantic. Um, I make a point to read all of his articles. I think he does a great job. And he wrote about acute flaccid myelitis this week. Um, so the polio-like um, illnesses that are uh, being seen around the U.S. And he does a really nice job of talking about some of the viruses that might be the cause of um, this illness, as well as why it's so difficult to find the cause. And so he talks about um, enterovirus D68 um, that you work on. He talks about enterovirus 71. And he does a really nice job of explaining for those sort of not deep in this uh, field exactly why it's so difficult to figure out what's going on with this um, disease. Yeah, it's a good article. And um, one of the people... Um, quoted Priya Duggal. She says, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I'm not so worried about the virus. I'm interested in the people. And I think that's the key here. I think the kids who are getting this paralysis, it's pretty rare, have some, mm -hmm. have some polymorphism, probably in an innate immune gene. And right. that's allowing the virus to replicate probably better than it normally would and maybe get into the CNS. Um, right, exactly. So, so the, the CDC is being very cautious about what virus it is, but this virus and the outbreaks of acute flaccid myelitis happened cyclically. It was every couple of years, so 2018, 2016, 2014. In the previous two cycles, mostly EV68 was isolated from uh, these cases, and this year it's a mix of 68 and 71. So the, in the article, Young says, uh, he quotes someone saying, we can't find the virus in the cerebral spinal fluid. And I don't think that matters because it's very hard to find polio in the cerebral spinal fluid. So don't worry about that. The real question that's interesting, these are respiratory viruses. They don't go in the gut and there's no viremia. So how does it get to the CNS from the lung? That's the really interesting question. And uh, that's what we're trying to work on here. 
Yeah, and, and I think it's really important for people who aren't working on this to actually think about that, that even though they think of polio as a paralytic illness, there's very little of it in the CNS, and doing experiments to look for in the CNS wouldn't be the best way to do your diagnosis. So polio is diagnosed first by seeing a kid with acute flaccid paralysis. paralysis. You take a stool sample and you get polio, boom, diagnosis. Mm -hmm. This virus is not in the stool. You get it out of the lung. You get a kid with AFM, you look in the lung. If you don't see it and the kid is AFM, then it's not the cause. It must be something else, right? right? So anyway, it's cool. Ed is a great writer. and he, Yes, he is. Um, he's always writes wonderful things about different infectious diseases. So I went out to Nassau Community College this week to give a lecture to a beta, beta, beta group out there. Oh, okay. Well, just like you did here. Yeah, um, so they have the first. Months ago. So they're a two-year college, and they got the, one of the first beta, beta, betas at a two-year college, which is pretty cool. And that is very so, cool. So um, I went to talk to their biology group, and one of the faculty, you know, she gets her science from Ed Young. <laughs> <laughs> she said that's she read I contain multitudes and that's where she learned all about her you know microbiome. So he's got a lot of reach. He does. Um I make my microbiology students read I contain multitudes. Yeah, it's good. Uh, they love it. Um and it's funny because they he talks a lot about ecology and they're so excited about all the medicine they're learning and I'm like it's okay it's secretly ecology. <laughs> yeah. No, I I think he's very good and it it just shows the influence that a science writer has, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's so, why they have to do a good job. Yes. Because people are getting their science from them. And there are a lot of science writers that don't, don't always do a good job. I saw a headline this week. Evidence is mounting that herpes simplex viruses cause Alzheimer's. Okay. Oh, okay. And I think we're going to do this in a future TWIV. Um, mm -hmm. Because I don't think evidence is mounting. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but people, of course, are really upset about Alzheimer's because a lot of people get it. And um, I'm afraid they're going to start thinking, well, let me just get, I got already got an email from someone saying, can I get a test for herpes simplex and get treated? You know? Right, right. So I, I think as a science writer, you have to be careful. And that's why it's important for scientists to communicate because they are likely to be very careful. Yes, exactly. So wasn't there a past TWIV that talked about the some of the herpes papers? Yeah, so we did one. I don't know if you were with us. You might have been. Where I think I was. They did transcriptomics on CNS tissue from healthy and Alzheimer's patients, early onset mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. And they found evidence for up-regulated up herpes simplex virus transcripts. Okay. Right. Yeah, I remember that. And I remember there was a partner paper about um, herpes and uh, her, uh, amyloid beta. Uh, yes, yes, you had pointed that out. Uh, yep. Infection yep. triggers deposition of of uh, amyloid, right? Exactly. Yes. Um, I mean, if you have herpes in your CNS, you have big problems, <laughs> right? So, it, so I don't know if that was virus or just transcripts, right? Right. It. I think it was just transcripts. And if you look at the numbers, the percentage of people who have herpes and the percentage of people who have Alzheimer's are not at all the same. And the thing is, these are banked specimens, right? Hmm? So you can't look for infectious virus because they're frozen and stored for years. But I would bet there's not virus in there. So I don't know what that means yet. Um, and this is what I want to talk about when we when we talk about this, there is a clinical trial ongoing here at Columbia to treat early onset Alzheimer's patients with a herpes antiviral. It's enrolling right now. And I went and looked. They say there's evidence that herpes simplex type one is associated with Alzheimer's. And I have to look it up and we're going to talk about it and see if this is correct or not, because I'm just not buying it. You know, 80% of the population is infected with herpes simplex virus. Right, right. Again, it's probably just like you had said with the kids with AFM, there's something about the genetics of how that person is responding, if anything else. Could be. That could very well be, yeah. Um, so I have a pick, which is a podcast called Goggles Optional. And this is a podcast done by Stanford scientists, and mm -hmm. I, in particular, episode 243, uh, where they interviewed me. 
each. <laughs> you could. It's called Viral Podcasts in Primary Colors. But this is a cool podcast done um, mostly by students at Stanford. And when I visited a couple of weeks ago, you know, they grabbed me and, and did a podcast. But um, they do all kinds of science. So they do things outside their own fields and they keep, keep it pretty short and they try and aim it at a general public. They have a whole team doing this, which is really cool. They have writers. They have people who do the interviewing. They have people who do the editing, people who do the website. Their radio station lets them record there, and then the radio station broadcasts it later on. Uh, once a month, I think, they do a local live show at Stanford. So they have a ton of support from Stanford, which I think is great. That they, is great. You know, they probably said, we went to someone early on and said, we want to do this, but we need help, which is not the way I started. I said, I want to do this and I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> and now, uh, but so this is the way to do it for a student because you don't have a lot of time to be doing podcasts, but 243 episodes is pretty damn good. That That is fantastic. And that's such great experience for a grad student too, um, in terms of actually getting to practice their science communication. Absolutely. And I have to shout out um, Rebecca Gelman, who is part of the team um, who um, works on the goggles optional. And Rebecca took my virology course here a couple of years ago, and she was going to be a neuroscience major beyond college, and she decided to do microbiology because of the virology course. So now wow. she's in microbiology at Stanford getting her PhD, and she's uh, working on the podcast. And Greg and Nicole were on the podcast with me. And they have a whole team that work on it. So check it out. It's pretty neat. And I actually listened to my whole episode. And I would suggest you listen to the very end because there's an Easter egg, which is a lot okay. of fun. Which is a lot of fun. We had a good conversation. It was really nice. And you should subscribe and, and give them a twiv bump. How about that? Sounds fantastic. All right. That is twiv517. And you can find Twiv, of course, on any place where you get good podcasts. You can subscribe on your device, your phone, or your tablet. Please subscribe. It's free, and you get every episode. And we get the numbers of subscribers. That really helps us know how many people are listening. Um, and if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. number of ways you can do that. Patreon, um, PayPal. You can shop your Amazon stuff through our affiliate account. doesn't cost you anything extra. We get a little bit from that. You can buy mugs and T-shirts, all those things. Microbe.tv slash contribute helps us to pay for our expenses and do a little bit of traveling to do shows on the road. And, of course, questions and comments, please send them to twiv at microbe.tv. My co-host today on twiv has been Brianne Barker. She's on Twitter, Bioprof Barker, and she's at Drew University. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I was hope that it worked out okay with it just being me here as the co-host today. Of course. <laughs> it's actually easier to say something when they're just two people, right? That is very <laughs> true. <laughs> very, very which is, true. Which is not to say that I don't love all the other co-hosts. And I think it's fine when we stumble over each other and try and get words in because that's the way life is, right? When you're in a, yes. when you're in a room at a seminar, you have to be pretty aggressive sometimes to ask questions and uh same thing as uh, on a podcast but i'm happy to do it with two people or or eight people either way we have good conversations about viruses well, it was a lot of fun so thank you you're welcome glad you were here I'm glad you were able to come i'm vincent Yellow. you can find me at virology.ws i'd like to thank asm for their support of twiv and ronald jenkies for the music You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>